This is The Crucible. The JRTC Experience. This is Scouts Out. In this series, we discuss scout warfighting skills and lessons learned in a decisive action training environment for large-scale combat operations at JRTC. Hi, my name is Captain Nicholas Rohrbau, and I currently serve as the lead planner OCT for Task Force 4 here at JRTC Operations Group. And with me today, I have Lieutenant Colonel Nugent and First Lieutenant Atchison out of 389 Cav with the 3rd Brigade, 10th, 10th Mountain Division. Sir, could you please introduce yourself sure. and tell me a little bit about yourself. Yep, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Ryan Nugent. I'm the squadron commander for 3rd Squadron 89th Cavalry Regiment, uh, 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain. Um, and my, a little bit about my background. So commissioned in 2004 from West Point, uh, went over to Korea, was a tank platoon leader for four months, and that was the last time I was ever on <laughs> tanks. <laughs> so uh, that, yeah, sure. fortunately that unit uh, deactivated 272 armor, and then I went over to 47 Cav and was a scout platoon leader over there on Bradley's. Finished up my time in Korea, and then had the opportunity to go to uh, 473 Cav and stand up the, the squadron there. So as a first lieutenant, I was like the most senior guy on the ground. <laughs> it, must uh, have been wild. it was absolutely uh, crazy trying to stand up a squadron from scratch. Uh, did time there as, as a troop XO, uh, deployed to Afghanistan for a 15 month rotation. Uh, came back, did Triple C up at Fort Knox, back when that was the home yeah. of the armor. Oh, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. And then uh, came back and did another tour uh, with the 82nd um, as, uh, in 173 Cav, spent time as a squadron S4, and then Charlie Troop Commander. Nice. Uh, after that, uh, was an OCT at JMRC with the Grizzly team, mm -hmm. and then did a CGSC interagency fellowship uh, in the DC area with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, <laughs> NGA for short, um, and then did my major time with, uh, at Fort Carson, some time on division staff, and then was the Battalion S3 for 4-9 Infantry, the Manchus, and then the XO for that uh, organization as well. Um, and then uh, went to the 194th Armor Brigade down at Fort Moore, and so the armor OSID transformation from 15 weeks to 22 weeks, that was uh, one of the things I worked on there. And then after that, spent two years in the UK uh, teaching uh, British captains, British doctrine. Wow. Uh, so that was uh, an enlightening <laughs> experience as well and getting to learn a little bit about their doctrine and their <laughs> army. Yeah, and then uh, took command of the squadron in June. Uh, we did a, a year train up before our JH, JRTC rotation. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay, so then could you introduce yourself? Yeah. Lieutenant Aiden Atchison, I'm the XO for Alpha Troop here in 389 Cav. I've uh, been in the Army about three years. Went to, so from Fort Benning, A Bullock, Ark, and Ranger. Came here, spent 48 hours on staff, <laughs> kept it short, thankfully. All you, all you need for PowerPoint. Yeah, that's, that's all you need. You can say you were in the three shop. That's it. <laughs> Um, spent about 15 months in the Cedar, so the dismounted troop, and then the last 16 months as a XO and a mounted troop. Nice. Okay. All right. Well, wonderful, gentlemen. I appreciate that. So, um, to let you guys know, right, as I'm sure we, we're, uh, I really asked for you guys to come down so I can interview you today, really to discuss the, the squadron's utilization of SUAS and the TTPs that the squadron utilized throughout the previous rotation um, with 310 here uh, earlier this month. Uh, I would really say that, and I think I speak for, for a, lot of the, a lot of the squadron here, or correction, a lot of Task Force 4, that, that the squadron did really well during this rotation. We're really impressed, uh, particularly with your utilization of SUAS. It's generally far above what, we, what we've seen in previous rotations at multiple echelons. And I want to kind of talk with you guys and see how, sir, how you ran your squadron through and how it was really executed at the troop level, um, the training glide path, and then how those TTPs played out in the box during this past rotation. So um, I figured we'd just start off talking the, uh, the road to JRTC, right? Because you mentioned it was about a year long, correct, sir? Right, right. And just kind of like what we were looking at, um, how you 
implemented into the squadron training plan any sort of direction and guidance and then how it was executed in terms of uh, creating a culture and a focus on SUAS. So uh, what, what did the squadron's uh, training glide path look like for JRTCs? Right, so we kind of developed this out of lessons learned from the nagorno karabakh War and uh, current lessons being learned in the Ukraine about uh, the, the use of UAS uh, and being able to, to maximize those effects before a soldier ever makes contact with the enemy, right? So um, my uh, guidance to the squadron staff was let's integrate it, our Ravens and our Shadows in every training opportunity that we had. So. As soon as we, we did the cadet summer training mission, when I took command, once we came back from Fort Knox, we were uh, in full-fledged prep for, for JRTC and, and on the road to war there. So we started off with the, the individual and team level uh, training and really building our bench of operators uh, to first be able to use uh, small UAS uh, at the individual level, whether it was the Black Hornets in the platoon, or building the operational proficiency with the with the Ravens and getting the flight hours they need to be proficient, and then having multiple operators as a bench, because as you know, there's so much turnover uh, within the squadron and the, and the troops. Um, and then what was really kind of key to success is we had a Raven master trainer who was able to help facilitate uh, developing those, yeah. those Raven operators. Uh, so a lot of work on the front side uh, in kind of building that, and then really having the troops back brief me on their, whether it was team training, when they were actually gonna utilize their small UAS, and uh, when, uh, you know, how they were gonna utilize that. And the S2 shop really helped a lot too, uh, helping develop that kind of understanding of, hey, we've got an NAI, we're not just gonna get after it with ground scouts, let's use every tool available um, to, to develop the situation and confirm or deny enemy presence. And then we collectively went up and took it, a, a, took it up a notch. Uh, we did a off-site uh, training event at Camp Shelby. Yeah. So the entire squadron drove 300 miles from Fort Johnson uh, to Camp Shelby, Mississippi to really get after uh, some collective training from crew gunnery all the way up to platoon live fires with sticks and FTX mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle. So that was a 35-day training event nice. where we focused on small UAS, integration of EW and SIGIN teams, and then we also had the shadow platoon uh, come out and fly for us as well. Pretty distraction free, being 300 miles away from, from Fort Johnson. I know a lot of units can't do that, but we had the unique opportunity to just really focus the squadron, and I had the opportunity to develop uh, the platoons and the, the troop command posts to really integrate those assets uh, in, that, in that type of environment. And then as we came back, we just maintained that proficiency. Uh, we did a brigade level operation uh, called uh, Patriot Peak. Mm -hmm. uh, that focused at the troop and brigade level, uh, from the troop all the way up to the brigade level and uh, maneuver and fires integration. Um, but the squadron made a whole lot of money at Camp Shelby getting our uh, platoons practiced and trained, integrating small UAS, uh, the EW teams just finding out their capabilities and limitations, right? <laughs> um, they do come. Anytime you get enablers, there are uh, potential friction points with yeah. that that you have to work through. Um, and then we also developed uh, the mortars as well. We did a mortep out there, uh, tons of uh, live fire opportunities, and really kind of perfecting our ability to, to use small UAS and link it to, to mortars and get the fires yeah, enterprise the going. shooter link going. Exactly. Right. So uh, with that being said, so just to kind of confirm there, so, so, you were, so you were able to link in with your external assets, so specifically thinking like the MICO, Shadow, as Shadow Platoon, as well as the EW teams prior to the Brigade FTX. So this was an enduring cross-organization 
right. um, or an enduring task organization that you were able to then bring those same elements, those same people, those same capabilities to multiple training events prior to just the, the pre-JRTC Brigade FTX. Right? That's right. And building those relationships, you know, uh, Patriot 6, Colonel Barnett really wanted us to build those habitual relationships um, across the brigade with enablers that we would be using during JRTC and, and combat operations. So, uh, you know, absolutely awesome opportunity to kind of bring the team together and work through some of that initial friction before <laughs> doing it for real at, at JRTC during a rotation. Mm -hmm. So, Aiden, what about for you? So, uh, for did you, did Aero Troop execute any sort of additional training um, at the troop echelon within the commander's like training guidance or his intent? We of, did so last November. So between like the individual and team level in the training cycle, mm -hmm. then we did a dismounted UAS sticks down in Rose Pine. So it, it was only like 30 hours, but it was fantastic because it eight mile ruck as teams into utilizing UAS. We had our fisters attached to us for it. So they like teaching people how to use ped sevens, hornets. We had a Roz. So it, it, like, it was a phenomenal training event to both let us know maintenance wise where we're gonna have problems on these UAS and external assets and then actually being able to fix it prior to Camp Shelby. So, so you, that, that's a really awesome point you bring up there. So this was a team level event, correct? So then we're talking about sergeants leading their teams with maybe some sort of oversight, right, of like staff sergeants or platoon sergeants kind of observing or kind of controlling training. But that ultimately when you have those 10 level soldiers out there or when you had them out there executing, it was that that their initial team leader that was teaching them how to use these assets. Is yes, that correct? Which, which helped a lot. Yeah, which yeah. is awesome because that would because I mean that's part of the culture then I assume of 389 where it's not just, hey, the civilian SME that's attached to ops group or you know the the platoon sergeant directly teaching soldiers. It's these are skills that we have created in the squadron that have now percolated down to where you have individual sergeants teaching their soldiers how to use these SUS. Is that right. is that a correct assessment? Yeah, that's that's exactly the mentality I was trying to go for in in building that culture uh, within the squadron to uh, first NCOs own training within the 10th Mountain Division, mm -hmm. right? And like teaching our soldiers what right looks like and making sure that they are confident in their equipment and they understand the techniques, tech, uh, techniques tactics and procedures that we're gonna use um, in JRTC was absolutely essential as part of this training glide path. We couldn't, we couldn't have done it if we didn't have the NCO buy-in. Okay, mm. yeah, and that's really awesome to see, right? Because I mean, I, definitely the, the concept that NCO's own training is certainly not unique to the 10th Mountain Division, right? right? That's yeah. a pretty consistent <laughs> theme to see throughout the Army, but uh, it, I do, I do find that I think it, I would assess that it probably led a lot to your guys' success, right? Yeah. That like that you had individual sergeants and staff sergeants that effectively knew how to use those systems. Because honestly, I'm, I would say that that's probably not something that we often observe here at JRTC. Is that there's usually one guy who's been to a training course. It's like a train the trainer type of course, right. but. It seems that with, within Aero Troop and probably the squadron at large, that, that we were able to, kind of, to to push that knowledge across the organization level bubbles to, mm -hmm. to allow for a lot of redundancy and depth to those. So that, that was really cool to see, sir. Um, so, and, and I, I would be interested to see the squadron perspective and the troop perspective on this, because particularly with you being an EXO, I'm sure you'll know all about this. But um, I would ask, sir, just starting off with you, what was the, um, what, sensors, right, specifically when we're talking SUAS, uh, is the squadron organically equipped with? And then uh, int more interestingly, what, what is the, what was the maintenance status going into JRTC? Yeah, that yeah, that's, that's a great part. So we train hard, right, with, with all our equipment. And uh, in, in the 10th Mountain, uh, we're not getting all the latest and greatest, the newest <laughs> kit, uh, so, which has its perks, actually, because this is tried and tested equipment, right? Mm -hmm. um, I had Ravens when I was a troop commander. So <laughs> not much has changed, but uh, so now we have Black Hornets down to the platoon level, which is awesome. Just another form of uh, small UAS for platoons to be able to see out in front of them. Yeah, it's not great on windy days and it doesn't go super far, but it's still like 
another buffer between you and the enemy. And it just gets you over that one IV line. Exactly, yeah. right? Um, and can absolutely extend your, your observation a little bit. And then uh, we've got the, the Ravens at the, at the troop level, and, and that's about it. Um, and if you're able to, you know, not get distracted with everything else that's that's out there in the commercial market, although it's probably awesome and great and would help us a lot, but I think it, it helped us focus our efforts and really, this is what we have, this is what we're gonna train with, and we're gonna become experts in those two systems. Okay. And then what's your perspective on that, Aiden? I'm sure that, you know, going into JRTC, probably post Patriot Peak, right? You've got a small window, you're worried about RSOI, right? I'm sure plenty of maintenance stuff, right? Like how many Humvees and JBCPs can we get up, right? So with that being said, what did Aero Troop look like in terms of maintenance status on their SOS, and where did that fall in the priority for you guys? So in? we have the benefit of being above MTO on Hornets. You're MTO 9 Hornets. We have 13. Okay. which helped. We were at 12 out of 13 going into JRTC. By the end of the rotation, we were at about six. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so crashed. this is a good thing, right? Yeah. I know, but, so <laughs> there's a contractor on North Fort who can get you like extra props, extra like small components that aren't as expensive. So you stock up ahead of time, which we have some very aggressive NCOs who went up there like <laughs> before anybody else in the brigade and just took everything, like everything. <laughs> Uh, in terms of Raven, so your m toad one, we had one. So we crashed ours at Camp Shelby. It was gone, lost to time. EW tried to help us find it, could not find it. Um, we managed to get another one prior to JRTC. Okay. Thank God, very like small window to. I, I know, impressive, yeah, right? Was, we were able to work the systems to, to get that piece of equipment. Um, so. Yeah, so we had a Raven the entire time, but it had not been flown at Patriot Peak. Um, so we had a lot of technical issues with the Raven, but mm -hmm. we, were, we were able to fight through them until the last two days of the rotation. Okay, so, is, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so we had a Raven until the last two days. Okay, so, so ultimately, even acknowledging that there may have been some technical problems, we were able to work through those friction points, and Aerotroop was able to operate both systems going into JRTC, correct? Right. So uh, ultimately, as far as you're aware, at least at the troop level, we were looking pretty good going and pretty healthy going in. And was yeah. that based on any sort of maintenance priorities from either yourself or the SXO? Right, so kind of two different parts here, right, is we gotta get away from the mindset that these are like golden goose items that can't be touched or trained with. Um, and luckily we've got a chain of command uh, with the brigade commander and the division commander who are like, fly the UAS, I don't care if it's lost. When we lost it out in Camp Shelby, I didn't get yelled at. You know, we did our due diligence trying to find it, but there, we didn't spend 30 days out there looking for it, right? Like, um, so there's a culture mindset shift that these are pretty much disposable type objects. And yep, we may have to do a flipple or something like that, but as long as we're using it to train, and, and using it to, to win during JRTC, like there's, a, you know, leaders are willing to underwrite the loss there. Awesome. Now, when it comes back to, to the maintenance point of view, like Aiden, I think can tell you, I am uh, very draconian when it comes to, to maintenance in the squadron, whether it's our uh, vehicles, comms, MBGs, radio equipment, and specifically our Ravens as well. So uh, there were times during the rotation that I was nervous about our ability to continue to fly UAS and, and Aiden, I don't know if you were tracking in the background, yeah, but- I could, I could hear it. Yes, <laughs> but Sergeant Major um, worked through those friction points, right, to, to get pieces of Raven parts that either Arrow or Blackfoot troop needed uh, to them for wherever in the brigade, if they weren't being used to get them to, to these two troops. And that's to Command Sergeant Major Baxter. That's right, right. Command Sergeant okay. Major Baxter. Um, yeah, driving all over the box <laughs> to make things happen. <laughs> like a good CS7 does. That's right, yeah. Okay, so that, that's awesome to hear, sir, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, as you mentioned, that's, that's one of the things that we see here, right? And, and it's one of these things where they build in, where they can build into, um, from small obstacles into insurmountable obstacles when we look at 
you know, that small snowball at the top of the hill that turns into an avalanche at the bottom of, hey, maybe we didn't train as much because we didn't focus on it early enough in the squadron training guidance, right. which then turns into maintenance issues later on, plus a lack of qualified operators, and all of a sudden we're leaving stuff on the table, right? Yeah, sure. So that's why I'm really interested in hearing about the, seeing the focus all throughout, not, not just the maintenance, not just the training or individual events, but it sounds like you had a, a holistic approach, right, to ensuring the priority on utilizing the system from at least a year out, if not more, correct, sir? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and, you know, looking back, uh, based on the success that we had at JRTC, I probably would have put even more emphasis on, on training uh, UAS and uh, getting more operators trained and certified. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to know what, what you guys saw down at the troop level in terms of operator either fatigue or, or you know, folks that were taken off the battlefield. So we had, going into the rotation, out of the organic, like 72 people that we took there, 10 of them were Raven operators, that's all. Which, yeah, that's which is a pretty good number. We had a master Raven trainer, about he PCSed about a year ago, so he was very helpful in getting us to that level of proficiency. Um, during the rotation, I will say there was fatigue because the Raven was attached to one platoon for the duration of the rotation. If we had utilized a trailer with the Raven and more spare parts and other just resupply assets in it, we could have actually flexed it to a different platoon based on scheme of maneuver. Mm -hmm. And that would have definitely been a much better TTP than just, okay, this platoon has the Raven at all times. Yeah. Um, so one thing I, I'd say that's really interesting that I just heard from there, Aiden, right, is and something that, to bring up is, is 10 Raven operators. It, it, I'm, I'm very surprised by that number. That's very rare for us to hear something that high just within one troop. And, and from your understanding, sir, is that about correct for your other troops? Right. Well? So Blackfoot had eight, uh, Arrow had, had 10, so, and then Cedar had uh, five, I believe. So I was tracking almost like a gunnery type mentality of, hey, these are our operators, and just like you would with uh, your medics or any other type of, like, these are the folks that are those operators. They're, they're current and qualified. They can fly. Um, but, you know, there is only one, you know, Raven uh, operating system. So where do you put that in the troop? And I know that was something that we discussed yeah. and, and we're best to utilize that, so. No, stuff. absolutely. Uh, I mean, but we, we'll normally see uh, few, many fewer than that, right? Really? We usually okay. see about two to three. So, mm -hmm. so if, once again, the focus on getting up to that number, like ten, is awesome. And and would I be correct in assuming that that was primarily due to the to the ability of having a master raven? It is. Yeah. So as a right. So as Aiden mentioned, uh, one of his platoon sergeants was uh, uh, master qualified, which was you know, awesome within the troop. And then at the squadron level, our Seaburn NCO was also Raven qualified. So what I would, or Master Raven qualified. So what I would give to units starting this journey is like pick the right person, pick someone who's, you know, passionate about drones and UAS and stuff like that, and pick someone with some longevity who can fill that position in your S3 shop. Um, because the brigade's got the BAO section, they're, they're great Americans, right? They want to help. Uh, they're usually um, focused at brigade level problems, though. They're focused mm -hmm. on the shadow and things like that. So I would not um, entrust my Raven training program to the brigade. I would keep that definitely at the squadron level or battalion level and really take ownership of that and, and fly as, as much as possible. I'd, I'd, you know, whether you guys were flying on Thursdays during leaders training time or doing PMCS on Mondays, like that was the, the, the repetition and the training that we were trying to get with those systems uh, throughout this past year, so. That's awesome, sir. Well, um, so we shift gears a little bit and we start and we kind of move from RSOI, right? We, we've completed all the, the final Raven checks. We at least have the systems going yeah. into the box, right? We're getting ready to execute our JFE. So, um, sir, what I would start off with is how did the squadron's infiltration go uh, during that first JFD period, so about the first same two hours? And then did we provide Brigade any useful intelligence or I information requirements? Mm -hmm. And then how did it, SUAS specifically play into that? Right. Yeah, so the, the squadron uh, was given a really awesome opportunity to enter uh, 
the AO about 48 hours to 72 hours in advance of the brigade coming in. So really getting an opportunity to understand uh, the operating area and being able to expand the lodgement. So, um, and, and during that, we really had a good understanding of the enemy's infiltration as well. Uh, so they were an airborne unit that just jumped on Geronimo DZ, and they were kind of in the same position as us. Like, how far could they establish either a security area or, or get into um, AO Patriot, as we called it? So we, we took a, a very aggressive approach uh, into uh, uh, doing a rapid and forceful zone reconnaissance uh, all the way out to a uh, reconnaissance limit of advance and then transition into a screen to let the brigade come in and have enough terrain to be able to occupy all those key nodes like PAAs, the BSA, all the different headquarters, uh, and of course the infantry battalions to, to, to come in and transition from movement to maneuver. Yeah. Um, for specifically UAS, we did that all in one period of darkness, essentially. So um, really understanding where we thought the enemy might be templated uh, really cued in our use of, of UAS. So um, in the south, there's these MPRC lanes with some low water crossing. So I directed Bravo Troop as they were going through there, hey, based on our uh, intel collection matrix, they were tasked to fly their UAS to observe those NAIs before uh, they ever got close to those. And then the same with, with Aero Troop uh, operating to the north on those two main MSRs. So, so this is a really interesting point, then, sir. And then Aiden, I, I assume you, you can probably confirm this, right? So acknowledging that the Ravens are at troop or, or in an infantry battalion's case, like at, at company level, you still view that as a squadron asset, right, which was then tasked directly to, like, by, you would task the troop to fly that in certain areas. Right. Is that correct? And, and so there's a couple of different uh, mentalities out there. One is like, hey, the troops got mortars, they've got UAS, it's got all this firepower at their disposal, let them go out and develop the situation. I kind of subscribe to a different mentality and when we're talking about uh, a complex operation between multiple troops, and there were actually decos following us in Trail 2 to, to set up key checkpoints on the, on the routes. From, from the infantry battalions. That's right, from right. the infantry battalions. Um, it needed to be a little more directive. And I think that's one of the key takeaways I have from LISCO type fight is that you have to be a little more directive because they, they don't have a staff. I mean, Aiden is the Troop XO, and he's doing it all, right? Like, so just to you know, make sure all our bases are covered, tasking a troop to use a specific asset on an NAI, I think is absolutely within bounds of what uh, the Lisco fight's gonna be like. And you know, I think it paid dividends for us uh, to be able to do that and confirm or deny enemy before we just drove our trucks straight into a low water crossing with no idea what could be what could be there. So I don't know if you got the awesome. same impression. Yeah, so so the first for that first period, right, it was about three days or so, uh, how did how did you perceive that in terms of SUAS usage? So obviously like I assume the squad you received some direction from the squadron on where to employ your SUAS, correct? And then did did that facilitate success at the troop level with the squadron applying that staff power or did it would it have helped more if you'd been able I'd to say Yes, the issue we initially had is that if you look at the NAI overlay, it's like the whole map is just NAIs, mm -hmm. just everywhere. Um, but the squadron order broke down further, like, all right, this is the NAI you are looking at with this asset, which is like, that's, that's normal. Mm -hmm. stopped, I was under the impression it's normal. Yes. From, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, I, I would say it did work. It caused a little bit of consternation at the troop level sometimes. We're like, oh, they're telling me my scheme of maneuver. Like, I, I want to make my scheme of maneuver. <laughs> but I'd say in terms of SUAS usage, it was yeah. successful. And then I know we've been speaking a lot about the utilization of Raven to collect on specific NAIs here. But um, how did Aero Troop employ their Black Hornets um, 
like to success during that first 72 hours because I understand it was it was kind of a mad dash right because mm -hmm. understanding the the how early we were able to get into the AO we wanted to make sure that we seize that opportunity and move quickly right right of which is a very fine line between you know rapid and forceful movement and just driving into contact. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so how how did Aero Troop see success in that through the utilization of those Black Hornets? So the TTP that we have for pretty much every movement to an NAI where there's templated enemy is dismounts, fly the Black Hornets at least one terrain future, or one IV line, like from where you suspect contact. Ideally, Raven has already e either is observing or has observed it like within the last like 30 minutes to an hour, and hopefully shadow before that if feasible, which was only feasible for the initial part of the infiltration. Um, so once you have observation with the Hornets, dismounts continue moving up. Once dismounts have secured or identified whatever enemy is there, then that's when you call for fire. And one, like you can call for fire the like the entire time. Like we had a lot. Of mortar rounds, we brought LMTVs for mortar rounds, which I was not a fan of initially. I, I'll I'll take that one as being wrong, Han, because being able to call just immediate suppression with over 380 rounds is like that's that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to just resupply at 80 percent and you're you're set. That's awesome. So you really like if you are engaging with a direct fire weapon system, like that's that's not from both like the squadron level and the troop level in terms of direction, like. Your engagement criteria is like always use IDF. Okay, that, that's awesome to hear. So like, so so what I'd ask is because it could be perceived from what you just described there, Aiden, that um, and that sounds almost kind of slow, right? Because yeah. you're talking dismounts, flying a black hornet at a certain speed, right? So uh, would you perceive that that you moved slower or faster as a troop overall by you? that TTP you just described there? Like, do you think you would have been so, faster if you had not been doing that every turn? In terms of like a, an increment where you have no enemy templated, you will move slower. But once you hit where the enemy is templated, and if you actually templated them correctly, it's a lot faster, because you're not bogged down, you're not getting mass killed, and then doing Casavac, and then you're stuck there for the next three days. Like, you can keep just creeping forward. And, and then understanding that, that there's probably a similar TTP across the squadron, right, and the various troops. Like, how would you assess the squadron's movement in terms of over time? Like, do you feel you made better progression through the utilization of continual dismounting UAS? slowly but surely throughout the training area? Absolutely, right. So if you're making contact with the enemy, whether it's uh, through the electromagnetic spectrum or through small UAS, like you're, you're still in contact with the enemy, right? You are meeting your objectives and painting the picture for the brigade for where the enemy is at. Um, and if there is no enemy, and you're absolutely, like if the S2 hasn't uh, templated that and you've done your Maku at the troop level, like yes, that's your time to, to speed up your your maneuver through those through those areas and then okay. yeah, slow down, be more deliberate as you're going through some of those templated uh, enemy areas or you have a specific NAI to, to collect on. Um, it's a lot better than having to do Kazabak. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's absolutely true, sir. I mean, that that's probably one of the best things is that when it may seem slower up at first, right? right? But ultimately, over a 14-day period or a 10-day period of force on force, slow, steady movement every day will be faster than right. rushing and then having to deal with mass cows and reconstitution back. And absolutely. Try it again. And we got to think about the infantry battalions behind us too. Like, how fast are they moving? Uh, in our rotation, it was one of the hottest uh, JRTC rotations, I believe, in a, in a long time, maybe, yes. maybe ever. <laughs> and, that, and that impacted uh, the ability of the infantry battalions to, to move. We, coming into the rotation as a brigade, thought, hey, we can do probably four kilometers a day and we'll meet all our march objectives. We had to reassess that coming through and be like, hey, we can only do a kilometer or two based on the environmental conditions and the rate of resupply for, for water and ice uh, mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So as a mounted force, right, we have to understand the capabilities of uh, you know, the infantry that are backing us up. Yes, <laughs> no, that makes, that's a great point, sir. Right. Um, so Aiden, I would ask you right at the troop level, um, 
how are external sensors, and I'm really thinking kind of like EW assets, right? And, and maybe if, if you had the ability to talk to the, S, the Shadow Platoon. But um, how, uh, how are external sensors integrated at the troop level, and do you feel that they were utilized effectively by Hero Troop? I, I would say yes. So I'll start with Shadow. So from Camp Shelby to JRTC, then our improvement in actually utilizing like the Shadow and the OSRVT system, like much better. Because at Camp Shelby, we just had all the components. You'd like throw them out on top of your truck, try and set it up real quick, log in, make it work. Um, between that and JRTC, like we hard installed it in the truck, like camo net poles with epoxy and screws in it. Like it, it, worked. it was kind of janky, but it, it worked. So, so you had no SRVT in your, tr mm -hmm. in your yep. troop headquarters, correct? Yep. And you can dual feed Raven and Shadow with it okay. as well. So you can have that, JBCP, HF, FM, all at the same. Like the, it's a good system. Okay. It's good. Nice. Yeah. Um, so how did that work then? For, for, uh, for it, it was it was pretty successful. A lot of times the shadow, which something that caused us an issue is at Camp Shelby, we were used to having the shadow like solely focused on us. Mm -hmm. But both at Patriot Peak and at JRTC, it's like there, there's a larger brigade mission and so you have to like take into account where it's actually gonna be. And Kate, you can't assume you're gonna have any kind of support. And, and that's a great point, right? Is that ultimately, right, squadron can request shadow support, right. but uh, that, is a, that is a brigade commander's asset that's probably looking a little bit deeper. But what that does allow us to do, right, particularly if we, even if nothing else, we just have awareness of what it's looking at, is it allows us to echelon our own assets, right? Because it may not be looking at our NAIs, but it may be looking at brigade NAIs that are just beyond our yeah, NAIs. Right. So now we can see, hey, we can expect that something is coming from this direction into our NAI and be prepared to receive it, right? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So, uh, in terms of EW, mm -hmm. we had two EW teams for the duration of the rotation. The one we had first was not as proficient as the one we had second. So, for the first half of the rotation, our utilization of EW was pretty limited. Like, it was usually from the CP location or just adjacent to the CP, trying to co connect the collect lobs with the V-Rod. Mm -hmm. Not much like using dismounts with the dismounted V-Rod or the Wolfhound at so all. So was that a mounted team then? Yes, okay. yep. They had two map Bs. Okay. And then for the second half of the rotation, we had, a, it was a fantastic EW team. Like they, they were phenomenal. Like they always wanted to dismount, which was great. So you could, you could embed them with a platoon and they could have their asset with the 240 and a platoon dismount team collecting and then we had another team with the troop CP so if you're jumping the CP they can collect lobs as you're moving and be like okay if you thought you were going over there that's your templated location don't like there's a ton of lobs very strong all converging on that location that's awesome so because this brings up a point right is that so EW teams can come in mounted and dismounted variations right so then Aiden from your perspective like you would say the, the dismounted EW team is probably a little more effective, correct? I'd, I'd say it depends on what you want to do. If you want to conduct reconnaissance and call for fire, yes, but if you want to find a good place to emplace either an MFP or a CP, like the mounted element will probably be more useful. Unless if you pull up like to an IV line, dismount your EW team, and then they do the same function they would do mounted. Okay. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. So then, um, sir, I'd ask you kind of in the same vein, but from the squadron perspective, um, how did we successfully integrate sensors across the brigade? So across the brigade, uh, it, again, it came back to those habitual relationships. And the Brigade S2 and the MICO, um, understanding our mission set and un us understanding those enabler capabilities and limitations mm -hmm. and being able to integrate them into the squadron. You know, ideally you want, you would want those uh, soldiers, you know, doing PT with you and training with you 24 seven, so on and so forth, but they just, they can't, right? Cause they've got other missions and, and you know, uh, dedicated training stuff that they've got to do. Um, but having those t key touch points to build that habitual relationship is absolutely key. And you can't do it without the buy-in of the Brigade S2, um, the Brigade Commander, of course, and the, and the MICO Commander to make it happen. Uh, I know some squadrons have gone to the mentality of, hey, why don't we just take the MICO from the BEB and put it uh, with the squadron? And, th and that's a technique, right? Um, my 
kind of going in proposition with that was, uh, I'm sure you've heard the song, Mo Money, Mo Problems. Yeah. For me, it's uh, <laughs> Mo People, Mo Problems sometimes. You, you get all their maintenance problems too. Exactly, you know, all right? their maintenance problems. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the human teams are great Americans, but uh, they need to be kind of working in the rear area, developing their sources and stuff like that. And then, like you said, the shadow is a brigade asset. They need to be looking a little bit deeper uh, than we're looking. I think it's good to have that uh, connection with the shadow platoon leader. Uh, we learned a lot at Camp Shelby just to be able to communicate, right? Mm -hmm. And I think help the brigade a little bit with, hey, they probably need a JVCP right next to their ground control station so they can communicate um, either back to the brigade or to us what they are actually observing uh, just in case we don't have the feed or, or whatnot. Well, I, I would say, because I mean, we had OSRVT at the squadron level too, correct? correct. So, so would it be a correct assessment that because we built those relationships and we, we physically understood the equipment prior to Patriot Peak, right, that we were able to act, that resulted in us having functional OSRVTs yeah. at multiple echelons? Absolutely, and, and Aiden led the way in terms of troop command posts, and uh, you know, when we were talking during the train up, he would, you know, he's like a mad scientist. He's like, I want to put this, this here and here. And I'm like, that's great. I need every troop to look like this exact same command post. So directing, ahead of Pierce. right? Yeah. So, so directing that each troop will have an OSRVT in there. We will test it and make sure that it's functioning and the comp set keys and all those things that can really trip up uh, units trying to do this thing um, is, is something you got to work through ahead of time. No, no, that's absolutely a great point, right? Because I would argue that a lot of times, kind of the same thing as we were talking a little bit earlier about training, training Raven operators, right? Is that oftentimes we see these OSRVTs. Um, I think a little bit before this, we were talking about the the anti intrusion kits, right? Yeah. Like these really cool things that we have in the rear, and then we just like, oh, it's time for JRTC, and we drag them out, and we haven't actually put them into operation and figured out how they work. So then we, it's too late once we get to the box, right? So. Mm -hmm taking that time and effort on the OSRVT ultimately bought us, you know, mo more ability to just see other things out there, even if it's just if it's just a screen that we're looking at. Right. It's looking somewhere a little bit deeper. Uh, so uh, I would ask, sir, because uh, the kind of the meat and potatoes of the rotation here, right? It's yeah. something that every every squadron commander wants to, wants to be able to answer. But um, did, did we fight for information throughout the entirety of the rotation? And if we did, how were sensors employed to maximize survivability? Because that's the name of the game in LISCO, right? right? It's like, yeah. how did we make contact on favorable terms mm -hmm. with SUAS to maximize our survivability? Right, I think throughout the entire rotation, I was, I was enemy focused, right? So the squadron was hunting the enemy uh, regardless of, of what was going on. And that's just kind of the mindset we had going into it, is that we were gonna uh, hunt Geronimo, uh, the evil Tarikans, <laughs> uh, across the AO. And the way we were gonna do it uh, was with small UAS and the SIG and EW teams uh, to make that happen. We, knew, we This is our backyard, right? Mm -hmm. And the terrain here uh, just is not uh, suitable for mounted maneuver against a mechanized force, right? Mm -hmm. So gun trucks against BMPs are gonna lose every single time and twice on Sundays <laughs> against tanks. Um, so really being able to, to see just a little bit farther in front of us uh, really helps set the tones for the troops to be able to employ their mortars mm -hmm. uh, and start getting fire missions worked up at the brigade level uh, to leverage as well. So that's kind of our mentality going into it. I don't know if you saw anything so, different. So what did you see, Aiden? Did you feel like you were fighting for information at the troop level? And then how did that UAS utilization that we were talking about earlier, those TTPs, maximize the troop survivability in those contacts? So it, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, where if you lead mounted or if you lead like with just dismounts without actually observing before they're physically there, you, you're going to lose. It's, it's not going to go well. Um, so we, most of the time, we were fighting for information. There were times where once you are in direct fire contact, it always transitioned from we're fighting to information to we're just fighting to survive. Mm -hmm. And so the key is to keep it out of direct fire contact so that you can continue to fight for information. Because your job isn't to fight to survive, it's to fight for information. 
Uh, well, it's, it's interesting that you mention that because, um, right, a, a lot of those times that's due to it, our, the enemy force being pretty quick to, to either catch you unawares, right? And now all of a sudden, as you mentioned, Aiden, you're, you're not really focused on your actual mission at that point. Because Geronimo is not going to be coming at you with the same amount of combat power that you have, right? Like mm -hmm. if they're going to get in a fight with you, they're going to make sure that they have overmatch, which is where we transition to that fight for yeah. survival, right? Yeah. But um, do, you, do you have any examples of where that SUAS paid dividends and allowed you to not get into that kind yes. of Yes, so we had, there was one night, I think it was like around seven or eight of the rotation. It, it was perfect, like I, I was very happy. So. It started with a platoon SP'd Raven ahead. So submitting a Raz usually just administratively every about every six hours is what we got to. Initially we had a lot of problems because I, I would not submit enough Razes mm -hmm. and I wouldn't template where they had to be submitted from or how far they should extend. Um, but towards the end, it was like submit a Raz every six hours for where you template them to be, where they are, where they might end up somehow. Mm -hmm. And worst case scenario, you have a Raz. The airspace is clear, even if it's not your radio yeah, yeah, that's in it. Yeah. Um, so that that was very helpful. But in terms of scheme and maneuver, it was what we talked about. So UAS, then Hornet. After that, dismounts, mm -hmm. move forward, then pull the trucks forward, and just rinse, repeat. And we called, within an hour, we called in 12 fire missions, two pre-plots, and then 10 immediate suppression, which the fire markers could not keep up, which was, <laughs> which was bad yeah. because we, we ended up wasting a lot of mortar ammunition, but it's better to waste it when you get resupplied at 80% and see how many actually get mm -hmm. adjudicated than to just Well, well that, that's a yeah. good problem to have, right? If, yeah. if, we're, if we're outrunning the fire markers, it means we're doing something right, right? right. We're, we're practicing the proper TTPs. We're leading with fire, fires and SUAS, right? The mm -hmm. things that increase the survivability of Americans. Um, that's, that's, a really, that's really awesome. And, and what I'm hearing from that is that, that none of this was really any, anything super complex, right? This no. is probably about a platoon plan of how, so, so something created at a platoon leader level, mm -hmm. and then just execution of good TTPs that were repeated and learned and just continue to be built on, right? right. Like, and just through repetition. Yeah. And so. just to be totally transparent, like not every platoon caught up on some of these techniques, right? And like, this is why we do this is so we can uh, see what works and what doesn't. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to do retraining coming out of this too to, to make sure that uh, we are proficient and have learned from the challenges that have been presented to us during this rotation. So, no, And that's awesome, sir, right? So we want to use that opportunity to kind of level the bubbles there and ensure that we're all at that same level of proficiency. Right. But, um, so then kind of transitioning from the attack into the defense, right? So uh, how, how well did the squadron execute security operations when we were you know, conducting our initial screen? Because I know we initially yeah. started off like, hey, we're going to be integrated into the main battle, battle area for the defense, and then we kind of pushed forward, we got pushed forward again, so we were able to actually get out and build a security a zone. Right. right. But then when we were executing that, uh, how, how did we employ sensors as part of that defense? Yeah, so the the way it, it ended up for the defense is, what, what we wanted to have happen was Aero Troop in the north in front of the Warrior Battalion and uh, Blackfoot down to the south in front of uh, the ramrods uh, and, and our Charlie troop out further to uh, give us a more uh, reconnaissance in, in depth, yeah. right? A screen in depth. Um, it didn't turn out that way because <laughs> the enemy has a vote. Uh, and what we had happen was um, Charlie troop in front of the ramrods and then uh, the two mounted troops in the north. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we had to do was adjust our um, our overlays to be able to, to match the where, where it ended yeah. up before the defense. And so same sort of TTBs in terms of, hey, you know, we're queuing with EW. OK, we're getting radio chatter that enemy forces are massing. OK, let's get our UAS up to identify um, where the enemy is uh, potentially going to come through using which avenues of approach mm -hmm. um, to kind of queue us in, in there. And uh, Charlie Troop was able to, to first identify uh, the, that the enemy was not going 
the most likely uh, <laughs> course of action, that they were, uh, uh, that they were going um, the most dangerous course of action, which was, was to the south. Mm -hmm. um, it was able to at least answer the brigade's PIR of which direction that the enemy's main assault was, was coming through. Um, but uh, that, I think, helped the brigade understand uh, what was uh, coming uh, through the ramrods AO uh, and kind of set the brigade up for uh, the, the counterattack or the pursuit, as, yeah. as we called it. So. And then what did you see at your level, Aiden? I know that um, you guys probably, it's probably a little bit quieter in the north, but I know there was some elements that were up there, right, throughout the night. Did, did you guys implement sensors? Understanding is at night, did you implement any sort of utilization of SUAS or other sensors like EW or anything? Yeah, so whether you're in the screen or you're conducting EA dev and you're in a defensive position, like you still fly the Hornets mm -hmm. very, very routinely. Like they have to charge, but if they're charged, like, I'd, it's better to fly them, even if just something cues you on to flying them, like you hear something far away. Because, like, even if you're in the north, you still hear, like, tracked vehicles moving further south. Yeah. Like, if that cues you to fly the Hornet, like, do it. Uh, it helped. We got an additional about one and a half to two clicks of depth from two four scouts who were just south of us. Mm. So having both HF and FM and JVCP with them was fantastic to be able to like, all right, this is exactly where you're at. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like, if you if you can hear something in this exact area, like it might be enemy, put a Hornet up. Oh, it's two fours, like sniper team. Like it, it was very helpful too, because they, they used our mortars to call for fire on BMPs. Um, they would help secure routes for us to where we could actually like not have to worry about a certain area. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so that's really interesting because you mentioned some there, like so basically including Hornet util Black Hornet utilization in your essentially your priorities of work, right? So you have a certain percentage of your force on security, a certain percentage resting, and then you know executing a certain your remainder executing priorities of work. But it's not just EA Dev and digging foxholes and hygiene and eating, right? Like we put we if we add UAS flights to that, particularly with something like a black corner that generally doesn't require ROSs, mm. it's definitely sounds like it's something that was a, a good TTP that led to some success, right? Because we not only just built proficiency, is what I'm hearing, right? But we also maintained a greater awareness of, honestly, not, not just enemy forces, but friendly forces, right? Because right. we knew, hey, like two, four scouts are still down there doing something. And we didn't yeah. just like lose contact. Well, it helps too, because you can integrate it in the EA dev. Like if you're maneuvering the avenue of approach like the enemy will, you can do that with UAS because Geronimo used UAS constantly to find our positions in the defense. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So that, that's, that's really good to hear, right? Um, because yeah, I, I, it seems like we're, we're working on building here, right? Hopefully mm -hmm. not only with 389, but across the army it is like a paradigm shift in understanding the how integral UAS usage is so yeah. it's good to hear from you guys on that. Um, did we and then did we integrate any other brigade assets? So uh, um, things specific like FA missions into our into our like sensor or SUAS plan for the brigade defense. And if we did, how how effective was it? Uh, so th the other attachment that we didn't talk too much about was the was the radars, right? The the Q50 radars, um, and that was something we did not train up with during Camp Shelby. Um, or uh, I think we had them during Patriot Peak, and if so, they're just one of those really hard assets to, at home station training to kind of replicate the operating environment that they're going to yeah. see. Um, so uh, we had them attached to the squadron, and we would uh, position them uh, in order to understand what uh, the enemy uh, f fires were doing, uh, and they would pick up their um, their. Uh, uh, points of origin and points of impact and helped uh, the brigade understand uh, where those uh, potential PA, enemy PAAs were at mm, uh, to, yeah. to leverage the counter fire fight. And, and I think we had some really good success in them. My understanding is that we, we fired a lot, like probably about 50% more counter fire missions on average because we, we had good radar placement, correct? Right, yeah, and, and a lot of that was, was growing too, uh, to be, you know, 100% transparent. We didn't fully understand their capabilities when they were attached to us mm -hmm. in the Ruba, and it, it, it really takes, um, you know, the, the squadron staff to really bring those attachments in 
uh, understand their capabilities and lim limitations, and then not just pass them down to a troop and be like, hey, you're now in charge of uh, feeding them and giving them fuel mm -hmm. and making sure they don't get killed, like also letting them know like how important it is of an asset and that it's in the right spot at the right location to, to give, give us those, those lobs so we can um, do the counter fire fight against the enemy. That's interesting. So, so um, if we're kind of looking at closing out here based sure. on time, but um, so, so we'll start off with you, sir. Like, uh, what, what will you implement in your future training to focus on the employment of organic sensors at Squadron Month, like as part of your squadron training plan? Right, yeah, so we're gonna maintain our, our Raven operator proficiency. Uh, we're gonna get healthy again on our, on our maintenance and everything like that too. I mean, it, when you train with this stuff, it breaks, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's just the nature of the beast. So we're gonna get healthy on our maintenance. We're gonna continue our proficiency flights. Uh, and then at any opportunity to integrate those, those teams, we will absolutely have them uh, attached to the, to the squadron uh, to, to do that as well as we go back into this um, uh, training progression coming out of JRTC. So uh, I'm excited to, to you know, take the lessons that we learned during this rotation. Um, we'll have some key leader turnover, yeah, absolutely. Always. And we'll, we'll rebuild the team using those lessons so they're not lost in the sands of time uh, and, and, and continue to get after it. And uh, the great thing about being here at, at Fort Johnson and JRTC is, is um, the ability to, to talk to units that are coming through. Um, and I, I've already met with some of the LTP coaches and, and making sure that um, we're spreading this throughout the throughout the um, throughout the force going no, forward. That, that's definitely awesome, sir. Yeah. And, um, I'd ask you the same thing, Aiden. So, like at the troop level, right? Looking forward, if you're you know looking at the next Arrow Five, right? I'm sure it's probably already been identified, right? <laughs> um, how are you? How would you encourage him to try and and build out the troop training plan, and, like glide path, to ensure that we're maintaining these good training events? And, and or focusing on improving our utilization of, of UAS? So, first I would say basically what Colonel Nugent said, that you just have to maintain the proficiency, because getting to the proficiency is the hard part. Once you have it, you can maintain it and still climb. Mm -hmm. So, in addition to that, the more that you can like automate what you do in terms of both reporting and requesting, so like having RAS formats pre-built out, whether it's in RIFMIS or it's in JBCP for when you're in the field to where all it takes is fill in a little bit of data and send it. And it's much easier, much faster. The turnaround is exponentially you know, better. So, so basically understanding the RAS yep. request. I, one okay. last thing that I completely did not know for the entire rotation and my OC told me at the end and it was, it was upsetting. Oh, no. Is that, <laughs> you, don't, you don't need a RAS, like just get an air corridor and then mm -hmm. you can use the air corridor and you don't have to resend it for approval every 24 hours. No, that's definitely so, a good yeah. point, right? Um, so, sir, I'll, I'll leave you with a final word. Um, I, I just asked, so what advice would you give to incoming rotational units, right, at the squadron or even the brigade level um, on how on how to focus on employing those TTPs and, right. and maximizing that survivability and being able to look beyond the, the lead soldier, the lead scout? Yeah, I, I would just say um, you're Everything I just said sounds incredibly easy, right? Mm -hmm. But when you try to do it at, at uh, JRTC, it's incredibly hard. Um, so whatever you th you're doing in your training progression coming here, add additional rigor and friction to it. So that way, when you do get here, you're, you're not just like, oh, I, I didn't worry about uh, am ammo for the mortars or, um, Oh yes, uh, that NCO that we had trained to to do uh, Raven operations is now on. Like you got to build that depth, you got to build that redundancy, um, and you got to add rigor to your training progression. And you can't just talk it. You got to practice it, and you got to set aside time to do it and block out as many as the distractors as possible uh, to get after those training objectives and uh, the squadron has to has to be uh, the keeper of that and really shield the troops uh, from all the other outside um, uh, you know distractors or whatever else is going on so they can actually build proficiency with those systems and build 
uh, confidence in using them and see that it actually works and it is effective. So that's that's my main going in point with, with my peers. Uh, at, if they're trying to get after uh, developing their SUAS program and, and uh, you know, being better than even you know being better than we were at the rotation and, and killing more Tarikans <laughs> and, and shaping the brigade's fights. Yeah, right. freeing our land exactly. So awesome. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate yeah. it for your time. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on the Crucible, the JRTC experience. The Joint Readiness Training Center is the premier crucible training experience. We prepare units to fight and win in the most complex environments against world-class opposing forces. We are America's leadership laboratory. Again, we'd like to thank our guests for participating. This podcast was created and produced by Mr. John Mabes. It was recorded and edited by Chief Thomas Rich and researched by First Lieutenant Anthony Cho. Intro vocals were done by Mr. Robert Chopper. Special thanks to Captain Jermaine Branch and Mr. Jeff England from Public Affairs. Be sure to like and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest warfighting TTPs learned through the crucible that is the Joint Readiness Training Center. Follow us by going to https colon forward slash forward slash l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e forward slash j-r-t-c. We'd like to thank our partners at the Center for Army Lessons Learned of the Combined Arms Center, especially the JRTC Call Observations Detachment. Be sure to follow them on social media as well. Follow them at https colon forward slash forward slash www.army.mil forward slash C-A-L-L. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and review us wherever you listen or watch your podcasts. And be sure to stay tuned for more in the near future. The Crucible, the JRTC Experience, is a product of the Joint Readiness Training Center.